I need God's grace today because this message has been in my heart for a, a few weeks now. Um, and it's been burning in my heart. Um, I think there's a message for us all here today. Um, and so let's just pray right now. Father, we come before you right now. And Lord, I just submit myself to you. I submit my tongue to you, my heart to you, your, my mind to you. Father, I pray that you would bring this message out of me as you've been, been working it in me over the last few weeks, Lord God. Father, we all need you. We all need you in this place. And we just say, Lord, here we are. Use your word to transform us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I want to take a look at some scripture today. I'm going to mainly land on one relatively quickly. And I'm just going to platform off of that. And that will be the rest. But I'll have other scriptures that come in there. And, but I want to start with this, this verse in John 16, 7. Um, Jesus said this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if, you do, for if I do not go away, the helper, everybody say helper, helper, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And so Jesus here is talking with his disciples. And, and you know, Jesus said several times and tried to talk to his disciples that, listen, guys, I'm not going to be around. I'm actually going to be crucified. People are going to turn their back on me. They're going to crucify me. And they didn't quite understand that. Remember, Peter, no, that won't happen. I won't deny you, blah, 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 blah. You know, the things that we say sometimes in our ex excitement and our zeal, that's just way off because we're not in tune with what God's doing. Um, and so he's just telling him, listen, I am going to go away, but there's a purpose to why I'm going away. And that purpose is simply this. When I go away, I'm going to sit down at the right hand of God, God Almighty, and we are going to release his spirit to come into your life. And that spirit is called the paraclete in, in Greek. And the simple terminology or definition of that is one who comes alongside to help. Now, I want you to understand this for just one moment. When you look at that definition, the Holy Spirit will come alongside and help. I don't want you to think that the Holy Spirit, come up here for a second, honey. I don't want you to think that the Holy Spirit comes alongside of me like this, right? The Holy Spirit actually comes inside of me like this. But the Holy Spirit doesn't come alongside. He comes within to help us. And so when Jesus was talking about this, he was setting them up for Acts 1.8. And that's where I really want to land today. Listen, it's a scripture that I'm not trying to insult your intelligence today. I'm not trying to, to bring something new out. I just burn it in my heart that Acts 1.8 is such a powerful scripture, but I think we miss it because we only focus on one thing. We focus on one word. And we don't understand what that one word carries out in the rest of, of Acts 1.8. And now this is a verse that you all know. The youth have it on, on the youth facilities there in the Beaches gym. Acts 1.8 is the verse. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Right? So I want to break this down. The word power in the Greek means dunamis. From dunamis, we get our word dynamite. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. We get the word dynamite. So we're not talking just like, you know, just a little 120. And I don't really know much about electricity, but we're not talking about a little bit of 120 where if you stuck your finger in there, you're going to get a little zap, but it's not going to kill you, I don't think. At least the times that I've been zapped by 120 didn't kill me. Woke me up, though. Um, but... It's, it's a dynamite, it's a supernatural power. It's not natural power, it's supernatural power. It means this, it means strength, power, and ability. Strength, power, and ability. It also goes on, if, if you study out the word, it means an inherent power, power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature, or which a person or thing exerts and puts forth. Now, I want, I want you to understand something. Because we can read that definition and we can go, oh, it's, okay. it's what I put forth. No, the power that any human being has in this earth is futile. It's earthly power. It's earthly ability. This is the power you will receive when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It is a God power. It is a supernatural power. It's a miracle working power. Okay? So, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It also means this. Power to perform miracles. Now, how many, have I, how many times over the years have I asked this church, 
How many of you would like to see miracles take place? And everybody raises their hand. Now, when I say the next question, do you realize that God's going to use you to do that? Then hands get a little shaky and they start coming back down. But the truth is, this is that power that God is talking about. It's a miracle working power. But there's also another component to this power. And it is a moral power. Okay, did I just lose you? It's a moral power and an excellent of soul. Okay, so we have power like dynamite. We have supernatural power. We also have a, 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 a miracle working power, super signs and wonders, all that. But it's also a moral power that produces an excellence of our soul. Isn't that interesting? How many of you ever heard that preached before about this verse? That it includes the whole experience of our life, our mind, our will, our emotion. Not just the power of God. And I think what happens is, I think a lot of times we get so caught up on that power word that we don't understand all that God's talking about here. We get, as, as a charismatic Pentecostal people, we want the power. Come on, who wants the power? Don't be shy to raise your hand because I want the power, right? And I don't want my power. I want God's power because my power is useless. The best I can muster up is I might be able to get a fire out if it's small enough. But I got nothing to offer humanity, but I do have the Spirit of God and the power that He brings in my life to offer humanity, right? And so I think we get so caught up in this word that we don't even finish the sentence. We don't finish it. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to Jerusalem, and so on and so forth. So we're going to receive this by the Holy Spirit. When the whole, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, to understand this, I'm going to take you real quick back into the Old Testament. Because all this links together. When, when, when the Old Testament was about, and God had to establish the things with the, the kings, the priests, the prophets, the tabernacle. God had an anointing oil. We'll call it an anointing oil. That was very specific. He had the measurements. He had everything that needed to be in it. It had to be mixed a certain way. And you could read this in the Bible. And it was actually a, to represent, if you study it out, it represents God's DNA. Okay? All in earthly things that he puts together. But he anoints it as it was anointing the kings and the priests, sometimes prophets. Understand that anointing wasn't for anybody. It was specifically for kings and priests and sometimes prophets. It wasn't for the general population. It wasn't for Israel as a whole. It was very specific. Um, actually, what would end up happening, if you use this oil for anything else, death would come upon you. So it was a serious thing. It wasn't just meant to be used and just sprinkled around or whatever. It was so serious that everything that was anointed with it was set apart for the service of the Lord. They also anointed, you know, the tabernacle of Moses had all this furniture in it and it had utensils and stuff. All that stuff was anointed because it was holy, consecrated, and separated for God. Okay, are you following me? And so what we see here is a picture of, of this stuff happening. And so we see Samuel anointing David with oil. Saul was anointed with, with that oil. But Samuel comes in, he anoints David. Watch Look at the wording of this, please. 1 Samuel 16, 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, which was the anointed, and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Now look at the language of Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Old Testament it was very limited. New Testament, under grace, the presence and the power of God is released to everybody. Come on, everybody say everybody. Everybody, everybody say me, me. As we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Come on, can I hear an amen? Yeah. It's not now just a few. It's now for everybody who declares and, and asks God to be baptized by his Holy Spirit. That would be willing to be submerged by his glorious presence and the gloriousness of who he is in its complexity, but yet in its fullness. We may not understand all the complexity and all that it means for the Holy Spirit to, to, to fill us, but it's all there. Yeah. Think of it this way. When, when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, it is the fullness of heaven. 
It's the fullness of who God is comes and dwells within us. That comes and empowers us, church, to fulfill everything that that word dunamis power means. So, I'm just going to just digress, not digress, but I'm going to do this for a second. And, and you could, I, could, you, I could spend months just talking on the Holy Spirit. We don't have time to do that today. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. But I do just want to give a couple of things, a couple of scriptures about the Holy Spirit today. And you're going to know them. They're not hidden somewhere. You're going to know them. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What are these? Fruits of the Spirit. These are fruit of the Spirit, but they're characteristics of the Spirit of God. Guess what? They're already in you. Because the Spirit of God is upon us, right? right? They're already there. Now listen, they may not man they may not manifest in your life, but they're there. <coughs> it's the perfect love of God. It's the perfect peace of God. It's the perfect joy. Everything is, is of the Spirit is perfect. But in us, it may not manifest necessarily perfectly. Is that true? Come on, let's be honest. We don't manufact or we don't manifest the perfect love of God all the time. We don't manifest, quite frankly, the joy of the Lord all the time. Come on. If you're not at peace, something's off. Because it is a fruit of the Spirit. All these things are active in us. It's part of, it's a characteristic of who, who Christ is. But the Holy Spirit, as our helper, is inside trying to work all this stuff out through us. Come on. Purpose of the power is to work out the fruit of the Spirit in us. That's where we become moral excellent. Come on. That's where our soul begins to be redeemed. It's, it's, it's where um, that, that soul becomes vibrant. Yeah. That's not where we're living in the past anymore. We're now living in the fullness of the new life we have in Christ Jesus. Why? Because the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. And here's the funny thing. Yeah, there's things we need to do. But when we surrender our life to Christ, and we say, Lord, I want to have the fruit of your spirit manif manifested in my life, what we need to do is just rely on him to do it. Here's the thing. When we try to make things happen in our life, we fail at it. Because what ends up happening is impatient comes along, right? I'm going to love better. Well, you don't do it. You stink at it, right? So you get impatient. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk in joy all the time. No, you failed at Well, now we get impatient. Impatient becomes, and, and long-suffering becomes that thing that we just fell at so much. But think about it. God, in who he is in his spirit, is patient with us. Have you ever thought about that? It is a fruit of the spirit. So God is patient with us. He's patient with you. As, as I read those lyrics, in your shortcomings, in the worst days you could ever have, he's still patient with you. Why? Because he loves you. And he sees what you can become because the power of his spirit is in you. Right. He's not sitting there going, can't come on, hurry up, for crying out loud. He's not doing that. But his grace is upon us to achieve all this. As we rest and, and submit our will to his will and his purposes and stuff like that. And then this other, uh, this other scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11, it says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom. Everybody say word of wisdom. Word of wisdom. Through the same Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge. Word of knowledge. Through the same Spirit. To another, faith. Now listen to me. I'm going to stop right there because I'm not going to elaborate on these. This is not faith that we need to come to Christ. This is a supernatural faith that God brings on people to believe for whatever it is they're believing that is beyond natural faith. It's a supernatural faith. Okay, It's a gift that God does. There's, there's times where people will put something on a person's heart that they're going to accomplish something, and sometimes it takes supernatural faith to believe it. Okay? We're not talking just faith to believe for salvation here. We're talking about faith to accomplish. Because when we go through these nine gifts, what you're going to see are these, these are empowerments that God gives to his church and to the people of his church 
to do work for him. That's what they're for. They're not for us to get all blown up in. They're for us to do service for him. Whether it's in the church or out of the church, it's to do service. Okay, I got off track there, but anyways. Um, so we have word of wisdom, word of knowledge, uh, faith, and to another gift of healing, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirit, to another different kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretations of tongues. But one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Now watch this. All nine of those spiritual gifts are all resident in you. They're already there. You don't have to work to get them. You don't have to prove that you can use them. They're there. And the only thing that gets in the way of us operating in those things is our inability to be in tune with what God's doing. That's it. That's the simplest form that I can tell you that we are the only ones that get in the way from God using those things. Now, as he distributes those, listen, he doesn't keep them to himself. He distributes those. And I believe personally myself that since they're all resident, God can use you at any time with any one of those nine if we're available. Right. If we're doing something for God and God needs to get somebody's attention through one of these gifts, he'll do it. But if we don't make ourselves available, then he, he won't do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. But they're all there, and I believe he'll use anyone at any given time in each of our lives. Now, there are those that he has gifted with the gift of the Spirit that are very strong on them. And, and like gift of healing, you see there's people with healing ministry and stuff like that. That is a gift that's on them, and it's strong, and it's staying there. Okay? But that doesn't mean they don't ever operate in the other gifts either, but that's just one that's dominant in there. That God said, you know, I'm going to distribute this one and it's going to rest on you for most of your life. Come on. Yeah. But they're all there. Mm -hmm. They're all present in us. Just like the fruit of the Spirit. They're all present in us. Can I hear an amen? amen. So let's go back to Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Everybody say power. 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 Everybody say Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Spirit. Now, here we go. And you shall be witnesses. I want to look at that word witnesses for a moment. That word witness is this in the Greek. It's martus. Everybody say martus. martus. Are you ready for this? Mm -hmm. This is where we get the English word martyr. Okay, I just lost you all right there, right? What? I ain't being a martyr. <laughs> The truth of the matter is, and you can see this in the Old Testament, because the Israelites killed the prophets in the Old Testament because they didn't like what they said. But you can even see it currently up today that through history, other religions have risen up against the name of God, of Jehovah, Yahweh. And they've killed people who have testified against Christ, or for Christ. We see it happening today with ISIS in the Middle East. I don't know if you know this, but ISIS has actually killed more Muslims than they've killed Christians truth. Okay? But they martyr people who stand for Christ. They martyr people who don't come along with their agenda, and they kill them too. But that is an example of a martyr. China has had a lot of people who are Christians been martyred over the years, decades and stuff, because there's just an opposition to the things of God. Now listen, I don't think we've ever had to worry about being martyred in America. I don't think we need to sit back and worry about it. I think we just need to live our life. Come on, we need to live our life. And if for one reason or another, you find yourself with a knife before you and deny Christ or, or, or die, God's going to give you a grace, a grace, a supernatural grace that will come upon you to be able to handle that. Yeah. Because if you see pictures of Christians being um, uh, decapitated by ISIS, you don't see them trying to run to get away. I believe there's a peace that comes over them. And there's a special reward in heaven for people who are martyred. Now listen, let's not run out and try to get martyred, okay? <laughs> God gets to determine that, right? But that word has so much more meaning than just being martyred, okay? And I'm going to bring this back around. But um, the deeper meaning of 
being a martyr is this. It means someone who loses their identity in that of another person. I'm going to read that again. It means someone who loses their identity in that of another person. Now, in our context, we're not trying to lose our identity. I'm not trying to lose my identity in my wife. The purpose of this, this verse and looking at this word witness is we are to lose our identity in Christ. Come on, are you with me? We are to lose who we are in Christ. I just lost. Did I lose you there? No. Nope. So I lose myself, my essential self, with the pur purpose and person of another. As Christians, with the power of the Holy Spirit, we lose ourselves in Jesus. His life becomes our life. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, and you will be witnesses. You will lose when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon your life. I'm going to change your life from the inside out. Not only is there going to be miracle working power in you, but I'm actually going to transform who you are and what you used to look like won't be what you look like today because I planted my gifts in you and I planted my fruit in you. And you are going to become a witness of me. Are you guys following me? Yes. Okay. okay. So watch this. How do we become an executioner and a martyr all at the same time? Because here, here's what happens. We are now our own executioner. We, are, we become our own martyr by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's in us. Watch. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live. I, want, I, want you, I, I pray in the Holy Spirit is just opening their eyes up to this. Yes. But Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Here we have it. I have been crucified with Christ. I choose to crucify the things in my life that are pleasing to God. I'm the executioner and the martyr all at once. I choose to do that. Let me ask you a question today. And I'm not looking for a response. This is just for you right now, for the spirit to prompt something in your life. What is one thing? And I'm only asking one thing because I believe God deals best with one thing. And we, do, we handle the best with one thing. What's one thing in your life now that you know that has been there and continues to be there and you struggle with that needs to be crucified? Okay, got that? Now watch. If you'll commit that to the Lord, I believe God will help you crucify that in your life. And martyr that thing in your life. And when that thing is martyred, more of his character will come out. More of that love, that peace, that goodness, that gentleness, that patience, that kindness, um, gentleness, or, or said that in self-control. It's getting quiet in here. Mm -hmm. And here's what happened. As we continue to commit things to God that we need to crucify in our life, what we end up becoming is more and more of a sample of Jesus to the world, thus becoming a witness of who he is. Watch. It's a witness of who he is by the way we're living our life because we're getting the old out. We know that the, the, the scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Fruit of the Spirit in there. Come on, coming out, come on. All that is, is we're a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. And when, and when we're looking at this verse, I have been crucified with life, Christ, he's not talking about your new life in Christ. He's talking about our old life. I, my old life has been crucified with Christ. And that old life lives no longer. Come on. This is the power of God in us. And this is the purpose of, of that power in us is to radically change our life. So now we become a sample of 
Christ in the world today. We're not Christ. Let me make that very clear. We're not Christ because not one of us can die and shed our blood and rise again. That's already been done. Jesus is the Son of God. He sits at the right hand of the Father praying and interceding for his children and for, and for the world. But we become a sample of that for the world to see. They see Christ in us. Paul echoed those words, follow me as I follow Christ. Paul echoed those words that say, when you see me, you see the Father. Jesus said the same thing when he was talking to his disciples, when he was talking to the Pharisees. When you see me, you see the Father. Amen. And I believe that's what God's calling the church all across the world today is to say, I have a purpose, and that purpose is a lot. But one of the things that I want to see in my church is I want to see me in you. Because when I see you, in, or me in you, what you do is you glorify my name. Yes. Yes. You lift my name up. You glorify, because it's no longer your old nature, it's the new nature that I've given you. Yeah. And you've surrendered to the process of crucifying the things in your life that God's just maybe not happy with or pleased with. Right. And listen, from here to here, we all have stuff that God's not pleased with. From there to here, we still have thing that God, things that God's working out in us. And it's just a simple matter of saying, Lord, I surrender all to you. I surrender it all to you. Yeah. John the Baptist said, I must decrease so you can increase. Yeah. <coughs> God is asking us today, will you decrease? Will that old nature decrease so my new nature can increase? Yeah. Because my new nature is there. It's in you already. Everything you need is there. It's in but I need you to decrease. I need you to start crucifying some things in my life, in your life. So I can come through more and more and more. You know, the, Jesus talked about rivers of living waters flowing out of us. That's the spirit of God. That's his life flowing out of us. But we have so many things. We, we got so many beavers in our life. Come on. That are damming up the river. Come on. It dams up the flow of the river because we allow things to still be there or we just haven't dealt with things that God's wanting to have us deal with. And you know, it's all good. It doesn't matter what you got going on in your life. It doesn't matter what debris that's clogging up. God is so good. He doesn't care what it is. He just wants to get it out of the way so he can reveal himself through you so you can be a sample of him in the world. But here's the thing. It goes on back to Acts 1.8. For you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be, everybody say, shall be, shall be. witnesses. Here's, here, here's where we're going to land, or start to land. We're coming down right now. To be a witness isn't something we do. It's something we are. Yeah. See, a lot of times we sit there and go, oh, I've got a witness. Oh, I got, No. You commit to what we've already talked about, and you will be a witness. You, you may be a witness with no words, and don't, don't go, great, I don't ever have, no, we'll get there in just a second, right? Because that's the easy thing. Great, I, I can just be a witness, I can kill everything in my life that's not pleasing to God, and I'll just be, yes, that's, that's the goal by the power of the Holy Spirit in us, right? But we're not to do witnessing. We're to be witnesses. It's a state of being, not something we do. Amen. And it happens as we surrender ourselves to the Lord. Amen. And allow that power that we receive when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to have His work in us. Yeah. But being a witness, church, doesn't mean that we don't use words. See, I want to take that away from you right now. Remember, we're not doing this, we're being this. Yeah. Big difference. It's a state of being versus us working at something. So, it takes words to share the gospel. I believe when we surrender ourselves and we allow that power to have its work in our life and we become that sample of Jesus, it opens up the door to the world because the world needs to see God. Come on. The world needs to see, I think the world is hungry to see God in Christians. The purity of who he is. The love of God. The peace of God, the joy of God. Come on. When we're in the midst of our, our, our struggles or whatever, we can be joyful because we have the fruit of the spirit of joy in us. Amen. We choose sometimes to be joyful because we have a reason to be joyful, even if our world's falling apart around us. 
Same with peace. If our world's falling around us, we have the we have peace already in us. It's just coming to this realization that, Lord, you're in charge. And I trust you even in the midst of all the battle. I trust you even in the midst of the storm. I trust you because you're in control of my life. And you have the best interest for me. But how often do we find ourselves in difficulty? We lose peace, we lose joy. Mm -hmm, right. And what the world needs to see is not Christians running around with in the dumps all the time. They need to see them in living real life, which real life includes struggle sometimes. Yeah. But they need to see us joyful even in that because we have a reason to be joyful. Yeah. Right. Jesus Christ died on the cross and we received him. He fills our heart. His spirit comes in us. Come on. We have a reason to be joyful even if everything's horrible in our life. Because in the end, he's got a plan. Yes. And so many, we lose track that God is doing something. He's working stuff out of us. He's working stuff in us. And he used, we even sing it today, he uses everything for his good. Yes. But we don't feel that way when we're in the midst of it, do we? We don't feel that way when we're in the valley. Because we get kind of caught up in it. And then that comes out in life. And I'm not saying this is easy, church. I, we all have to, I have to deal with the same things. I have to deal with the battles of things in the church and, and working through them. And sometimes I'm serious. I'm going to be honest with you. It weighs me down sometimes. But in being weighed down, I can still be joyful. Yeah. Don't always do that. You can always be peaceful. Don't always, listen, I'm being honest with you. Sometimes it's not easy with the battles that I face to always be joyful and at peace. Yeah. But I know it should be there. Yeah. And I want it there. I don't want those things influencing how I treat people or how I do things in the church. Come on. Mm -hmm. The same is true for you. But it takes words to share the gospel. And I think that's where we start losing, losing it in the charismatic Pentecostal church. Right? We get stuck on the power thing. We want the power thing. We want the signs and wonders. We want the miracles to be happening. Sometimes I think that's more for us than it is actually for the glory of God. Yeah. Come on, I'm being honest with you. Sometimes I think it's more about us than, than about the glory of God. Okay? But here's the thing. It takes words, and we think those words mean we need to preach at people. Come on. Am I losing anybody here today? Because I don't want to lose anybody. We feel when we have to share the gospel, we feel like we've got to get up on a table and we've got to preach a message to people. And that's not what we need to do. Here's what Jesus did. And I'm going to make the New Testament real simple for you, the Gospels. Jesus loved and gave grace. He spoke truth and grace and love, but that's all he simply did. He loved people wherever he went. He had compassion on people wherever he went. He spoke truth wherever he went in love. That's the simplicity of the Gospel. Now you mix those words with being a martyr, being a martyr, crucifying your flesh, You've got a combination of great power that will flow through you. Right. And it's already there. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not only already there, but God wants it out. He wants to reveal himself in the world. And so just to take you away from this idea that you don't have to use words, there is some action to it. And again, we're not doing, we're becoming. We are witnesses. So this is a state of being, not something we're striving to be. Because that would be more doing than just resting in it, allowing God to do his work. Here's some scriptures for you. Acts 10, 38. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and power. And all God, Jesus did was just went around and loved people, had compassion on people, right where they're at. Sinners, 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 people who were lost, people who were possessed, deaf, uh, blind, whatever it was, paralytics, whatever. Drop C, just go down the list, go through the Gospels. He went around simply loving people. Actually, Jesus was the Gospel being manifest as he walked this earth. Yeah. That's all it was. Look at the life of Jesus. Did you see him preaching? Did, I mean, obviously he had the 5,000 and the 4,000 and stuff like that. But Jesus wasn't preaching a gospel message. He was living the gospel message. 
But we think, well, I got to use these words. I got to outline. I got to, you know, I got to do. That may come. It may end up sitting down with someone and doing that. But we start by loving people right where they're at. No matter what they're going through, no matter their economic status, we love people where they're at and allow that love of God and, and the fruit of the Spirit to come out in that situation. We make it so hard and we lose so many opportunities because we have this idea that witnessing must look like this. I must have a theological degree to witness. No, you don't. Please don't have. That will mess it up. Just love people. Just love people. And let God's love flow out. So we come to the to, to 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 5, and it says, And my speech and my preaching were not with pervasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen. Listen, what we see when Jesus walked the earth was him simply living the gospel. He was the gospel. And God released power in that. Okay, the old age question for the church, how many want to see miracles happen? We all raise our hand. How many understand God's going to use you? Yes. He's going to use you. Yes. But as you go out and you live like Jesus lived, that's where the power is going to release. Yes. We don't have to muster it up. We don't have to conjure, conjure, conjure it up. We just have to be witness. Yes. And it will naturally flow out. Amen? Yes. So Paul, again wasn't enough that he told the Corinthians this, but he had to tell the Thessalonians likewise. For when we, for when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave us full assurance that what we said was true. See, God's going to confirm when we love like Jesus loves with power. He's going to confirm it with signs and wonders. He's going to confirm it with the supernatural, the gift. He's going to confirm it because that's what he does. What he says is truth. It's life. It sets people free. And then he backs it up. Come on, church. He backs it up with the miraculous. Yeah. Why are miracles for the world? For the lost? It's because they need to see God's put a stamp of approval on us loving, on us speaking and loving people. He puts a stamp of approval. He shows off to say, hey, what they're saying is true. When we simply meet people in their need and love them where they're at. God shows up and shows off. What well, not that awesome? Mm -hmm. So I want to close with this. 2 Timothy 1, 7 and 8, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So never be ashamed to tell other, others about our Lord. Yeah. So real quick, God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity. Where does that come from? It comes from the enemy. Why? Because he doesn't want you to be a witness. And so he comes against you with fear. Guess what? When fear comes up, when, when God's prompting you to talk to somebody in your sphere of Jerusalem, which would be your workplace, maybe your sphere of, of Judea is maybe somebody in activities that you do here and there, maybe it's the grocery store, whatever it is, we all have the sphere that we, we live in, but when he prompts you to, to, to love people and to be Christ to them and to live out the gospel before them, the enemy will bring fear. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're not going to do that. You're going to look like a fool. You know, whatever the enemy does, he knows what to do in your life. Right? Come on. Yeah. He knows what to do in your life. So what does it do? It causes us to shrink back. But when we shrink back, the power still there doesn't get displayed. So he hasn't, he, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear and timidity. Watch. But of power. Everybody say power. power. God's given us that. Right? But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Right? Love. Power. Love. And now here's, here's a good one. Self-discipline. I want to take that back to the fruit of the Spirit. Self-control. Right? God didn't give you power that you can't control in, a, in the right way. Right? He hasn't given you love that you can't control. These things that are love and power not under control are being used in the right way, become distorted and false. Okay? 
But he's given us the ability to self-discipline ourselves. He's given us the ability to control ourselves. He's given us the ability to, to be baptized in his Holy Spirit. Come on. To do the work that he wants to do in our life and to be that river of living water that flows out of us unhindered by the things the fever dams up in our life. Amen? Amen. And we really shouldn't be ashamed to tell people about our Lord. We shouldn't be ashamed to just simply love people. Because that's all Jesus did. Break it down. He just simply loved people. Who did he have his issues with? The Pharisees. If we were to bring that in today's modern issues, or the modern realm of, of the church today, if Jesus would have any problem with anybody, it would be the church. He had a problem with the people that ran the, the tabernacle, the, the, the synagogue back then. Who were they? They were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. Who would he have a problem with today? The people in the church who were religious. People in the church who, who were this or that, who are, don't have the mind of God. That's who he would have a problem with today. But for you and I, if we come to this place of going, man, Lord, I thank you for your power. I thank you that you baptized me in your Holy Spirit. You submerged me in the fullness of what it is. Now help me, Lord, to see the full fruition, fruition of all that come to play in my life. Not only having moral excellence, not, not only having my soul healed in all aspects and areas, and my body healed and, and that, but help me to just be like you. Yeah. To simply love people just like you did. And when I do that, Lord, I thank you that you're going to pour out. Mm -hmm. That river's going to flow out of me. I thank you that that river will flow out. And Father, you will bring miracles. And the miracles aren't about me. It's not my ability because my strength is nothing. It's about your power being on display for his glory. Amen. Amen? Amen.